gag me, take me to the bunny ranch. People dying, kill me in the packing house. Even you have to. Hey! Hey, hey! I'm being joined by uh, Will Wheaton, the Will Wheaton, with, Hi. One, with one L. With one L. I know. Why is that? When I was a kid, my mom wrote a note to my dad, like when I was a baby, mm-hmm. wrote a note to my dad, and she signed it, uh, signed my name with one L, and it just stuck. It just stuck? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if, if so, like, so that's the official story. Gotcha. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. Yeah. Uh, my parents aren't reliable narrators, so, yes. I, so I don't know if that story <laughs> is true. Um, uh, but when I was, I, I, remember, I remember when Fresh Prince of Bel-Air premiered, Will Smith for a hot minute was Will with one L, and I was so excited, so dope. I was, so, I thought it was so cool, and then he changed it to two L's, well, which was I, a giant I'm, bummer. I'm Mac, uh, but M A C K. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's like, why? It's like, I don't know. I didn't pick it. My my parents did that. Yeah, and it's yeah. Like, that. like, yeah, it's like Mac, like the truck. Remember those trucks? Yeah, like, sure. Yeah, I actually have a hat over there. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. What? So you know, Hardwick and I have the GIF GIF. Um, uh, debate. Um, oh, oh yes, he yes. says he says GIF is pronounced with a hard G. I say GIF is pronounced with a soft G mm-hmm. because the guy who invented the format says GIF. says GIF. And my argument is, telling him that he did it wrong is like telling someone that they gave their child the wrong name. Yeah, exactly. Or they're pronouncing their child's exactly. name wrong. You don't get to do that. No, you, exactly. Like, yeah, it's it's people. You, you call people what they want to be called. Yeah. Essentially, like, yeah. I remember when um, Seth and I were working with uh, Marilyn Manson on uh, on Party Monster, uh-huh. and it was like, what do we call him? You know, do we call him Marilyn? Do we call him Mister Manson? Manson? Yeah. Do we call him Brian? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so we were debating this, and it, it, it came down to at the very end. I said. Call him whatever he says his name is. Yeah. That's it. And so, so, he so walked, what, what did he say? He walks up and goes, hey, I'm Manson. So there you go. It's Perfect. that easy. There you go. Now, now question answered. Th- thank you for taking that off the table. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're, but uh, um, you've been working. Actually, I, I, I did look at your, uh, your resume. I don't really do research before these things. But, I mean, your first gig was in 1981. That's yeah. what it says in your little IMDb yeah, thing. Yeah, and I'd been doing commercials even before then. Oh, geez, really? Yeah, I, I started doing commercials in 78, 79. Fuck, how old are you, man? I'm 47. Oh, geez. And, well, you look uh, great. And thanks. Yeah. So do you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> look at us, a couple of good-looking <laughs> guys look, in the Just a couple of good-looking middle-aged white guys <laughs> yeah. talking about stuff. It must be a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so, so I, um, uh, uh, my mom started me when I was seven. Uh, I didn't have a voice in it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I was at like four and then I got my first real paying gigs at six. You can, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Like, yeah. I just think like who looks at their child and goes, I can't wait to put this kid to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, someone's got to earn in this family. Might as, yeah. well, might as well be the six year old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really struggle with that. I struggle with really? that reality. Yeah. And I feel weird. Like I know peripherally a little bit of your story with your folks and, and, yeah. and, and, and I, and, and just your history of being a lifelong actor Mm -hmm. i struggle with it a little bit because i'm so proud of the work that i did yeah i'm a good actor yeah and i was a good child actor yes like to be a good child actor you need to be like you need to take direction really well Mm -hmm. and you need to have kind of like just a a, you need to be comfortable with yourself Mm -hmm. i didn't get uncomfortable with myself until i was probably like right around the time after stand by me came out okay that's when i started to get uncomfortable with myself because i became aware of what i was doing and because that, that hit hard and i'm sure you're, you're hearing it in both ears and there's expectations that yeah exactly it's like well if i did this i have to do something better or mm-hmm. i have to do something as good or yeah. you know whatever yeah um and it's taken me my entire adult life to get comfortable and accept the fact that that was a thing that was kind of put on me mm-hmm. that I was good at, that I'm proud of. I don't want people to feel guilty for enjoying the work that I did. Yeah. Right. But it wasn't me. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Huh. Um, and, see, for most of that, you're preaching the choir kind of thing. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like I, I did, I, I, I have one gig that everyone remembers me for. Like, I mean, I, I have a lot of like, yeah, it's, 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 I still have a, no, no, honestly, no, I remember you like, uh, uh, uh well, of course, Star Trek and yeah. things like that. I'm a big Trekkie. Uh, um, or Trekker. I don't know, whichever you prefer. I've always um, said Trekkie. I yeah, feel like uh, if you need to make a distinction, you're letting a bully define how you like that's your thing. What I'm, that's kind of the way I feel, and too. And I think you don't get to do that. Like, yeah. however a fan 
of Star Trek chooses to identify yeah. themselves is a hundred percent valid. Yeah, exactly. It's like Will with a single L. Yeah, yeah. Whoever yeah. You or identify. Mac like the truck. Exactly. <laughs> Darn too. <laughs> and also, I, I, you know, I just watched. Uh, actually, I watched it once and a one and a half times uh, before this because uh, I forgot how much I love that movie, Toy Soldiers. I've been hearing that from people lately, which is weird because this movie's awesome. It's a fun little movie, and it's but it's popcorny and it's kind of disposable, you know. Totally. Like, like and 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 I remember at the time feeling like trying to convince myself, Sean Astin and I, trying to convince ourselves that we had made a movie that was more meaningful than it was, right? Mm -hmm. That that and and uh, eventually growing to accept that this is a fun little movie. No, it's, it's and, totally fun. And it's and it's like and it's it's kids who everybody decided were just outcasts and yeah. worthless, showing everyone that they're actually more capable we than can they take gave on the them terrorists. For. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that movie. Although I found a plot hole. What is it? Okay. So you know how um, they distract the terrorists with the uh, the remote control airplane. Yeah. Uh, so he can get out and yeah. get all the information out. Yeah. Uh huh. Why didn't they just put all the information on the plane and fly it out? That's a great question. That yeah. Why didn't <laughs> Sam and Frodo just ride the eagles to Mordor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's a, it's the toy soldiers version of yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you ever think about that that plot hole? You ever, you ever I can heard? honestly say it's never crossed really? my mind. Oh, it's so weird. You know, it, it only took uh, me about like yeah, like twenty five years to find it, but I found it. But I remember <laughs> when we shot that and how cool that little remote control airplane Actually, was. It's pretty dope looking. It was a fun little thing. Yeah, and uh, the uh, um, we got we got very close the the four of us that I that, can see that. that summer. It um, translates on film. Yeah, um, we we really. Um, I remember. Uh, feeling like Keith Coogan and Sean Astin really understood acting and they understood mm -hmm. drama and filmmaking at a level I did not. Oh, really? And I spent tons of time with each of them mm -hmm. um, just like listening to them talk about art and, yeah, and yeah. talk about creativity. Mm -hmm. And I was 18. Like that was a great moment in my life wow. to yeah. be on location with people who I respected doing a thing that I thought was fun and cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, and, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like a really sweet gig. Do you still have your earring from that? <laughs> the dangly on yeah, earring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sure you like, you know, you have like a little <laughs> box in your desk and you pick it out and just pet it every once in a while. It's in one of those. It's in the same kind of box that super, Superman keeps a piece of kryptonite yeah, in. Exactly. Like, Just... It's there. You know it's there, but you're never going to open it. You're never going to touch it. All right, all right. Yeah. So, so you're saying you still have it. Great, great, great. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> and was that the first time you ever got shot up? Was it got squibs? Yeah, yeah it was right. the first time I was squibbed. Nice. And I don't know how they do it now, but back then they put a uh, like a double thick piece of neoprene on me, kind of like a, a neoprene vest. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they attached the squibs to mm -hmm. the inside of that T-shirt. Yeah. And I remember Dan Petrie telling me he was the writer director. Dan yeah, Petrie yeah. Jr. I, I worked with uh, Don. Uh, you know. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, his brother. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And also, I worked with his father as well. No way. Yeah. yeah. I my, met his. My first movie when I was a kid was was Dan Petrie, and my last director, like before I took a break on uh, on Richie Rich, was Don Petrie. No way. So yeah, I, I got my whole child like kind of experience was was so book ended by, by them. By Petries. Oh, yeah. Dan was great. Dan like really he he gave me kindness and and respect and and uh um patience and grace that 18 year old me did not deserve 18 year old me was so dunning kruger he <laughs> thought he was so amazing uh -huh. and he just was so incompetent and so no, unexperienced. I, I wouldn't say you were and so incompetent maybe not incompetent but I definitely know. inexperienced that, that's you ragging on yourself you know yeah, yeah, yeah i mean yeah. Def, definitely an inexperienced kid who did not like just had Do you have a little chip on your shoulder maybe a little bit yeah, yeah. Okay. well i mean feeling like i've done this forever and now yeah. i'm in adult and why can't these people listen to me just yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. oh i've been doing this forever Look yeah, at yeah. Mm -hmm. um but dan was so kind and always just very calmly and and uh and 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 just, and and simply explained to me the things i didn't understand mm -hmm. and i think got a better performance out of me than another director would have gotten because he got me out of my way Gotcha. And and so that was at a moment in my life where I was determined to like take advantage of technique and mm -hmm. uh, and 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 um, 
really lean into like making big character choices. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I remember seeing in a couple of dailies, like I just busted myself acting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you can see, and, yeah, you can see your, you can see the performance, yeah, and not the character. Yeah, okay, I and I that. remember Dan Petrie really helping me get out of the way of mm. that. And you were playing like an Italian like kid. I love it. It's like you're, you're always talking about how you want to jump him. Let's just, oh, let, let's just jump man. him. <laughs> the day, first day of production, Dan says, will you do an accent? Like for an this Italian role? New York accent. And yeah. I said, well, I mean, I can try, but I don't want to sound like Corey Feldman in Lost Boys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't want that kind of like affected. Yeah, no, it works. It works. Thing. Honestly, and, like, like and, I said, I've rewatched it. Yeah, no, yeah. it still, it still holds, dude. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's funny to me like that, that movie stands up. Um, uh, in a very specific way. Uh-huh. Um, yes. It's a very specific moment in time. Like it screams 1990, all of our clothes it's, and all that it's stuff. Perfect. Oh yeah, no. Some of the um, some of the colors like are just great. Like yeah. of, the, of the wardrobe. It's you know, yeah, love it. Well, that was one of the things Dan said that he wished he had done differently. Is that I was wearing this dark tie dyed shirt with a with a tie dyed peace symbol on it. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and when you and, get shown up, and, and we were, and we were <laughs> like, oh how like uh you know how 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 much of a, a great statement this is however because it's dark the bullet w- shots don't really show clearly yeah, yeah, on yeah. it no if you had just a white <clears throat> t-shirt on and yeah, it was yeah. like it should have been a different t-shirt <laughs> my so. one regret yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the project yeah but like honestly if that's your regret you did a pretty good job. yeah exactly no it's, it's still it's still fun it, i mean it makes no sense that Luis gossett jr like they allow him just free reign everywhere like it's kind of like oh he's he's the dean so he can he you know can, yeah he, he can dean around yeah, no, yeah sure no he, he can dean around in in the special you know the special ops tent with yeah, all the yeah. soldiers like, yeah. Gonna like yeah all right all right there you go my favorite line in the entire movie is lose and it's improvised uh at the beginning of the movie we go out uh, uh after we get busted mm-hmm. with the uh fake mouthwash yes yes and uh, the sex hotline and all right. that stuff yeah we, we put all of his stuff out on the quad yes Every, everything put yeah. it on right so we're getting ready to shoot that that take and we're all we're all on our marks and Sean either he asks somebody to give him a banana or he just grabs a banana from mm-hmm. somebody and he starts eating it very sullenly mm-hmm. and he's like I'm just doing this and we're going to see what happens yeah and he throws the banana peel in the trash mm-hmm. and Lewis Gossett Jr says Pick, Pick that, up uh, that yeah, banana. banana. <laughs> oh, yeah, and the way he says banana, too. Banana. Banana. 100% <laughs> improvised. And it was just, and that was one of the things that I clearly remember about that production that I loved so much, mm-hmm. is that we were all, Dan Petrie created an environment where it was entirely appropriate for us to make offers and to experiment and to take creative chances. Yeah. And we had the good sense to not uh, abuse that privilege. Yes. Yeah. So when, when something like that could come up, yeah. So everyone could embrace it. You know, it yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I remember Sean just saying like, I just wanted to make an offer to him and see what he would do with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it ends up being my absolute favorite no, line yeah, exactly. in the entire movie. No, and, and great instincts too. That's yeah. great. Oh, that's freaking fantastic. Yeah. Hold on, my cat litter box just went off. We have one of these dome cat litter boxes. Oh, yeah. They kind of like do this, but yeah. it's also one of those things where uh, I, I've had it like on. Actually, funny enough, it was Jerry O'Connell was on. Okay. And he, and he was over, and we were actually sitting even further away from yeah. it than we are now. And the cat box went off? And it went off, and it was loud as fuck when I listened back to it. <laughs> and now I'm sitting like twice as close to it. Yeah. Like, yeah, so <laughs> given give, give that, given that. So, uh, um, but I, I brought up uh, uh, with him. I brought up uh, Stand by Me. Yeah, and uh, and here's the thing: he's still kind of a little sensitive about being called a fat kid. Really? Yeah. He was like, kind of like, oh. <laughs> I was like, no, it's like you look great right now. Like, no, no. He like, grew up to be a beautiful man. Yeah, exactly. Like, no, and he's awesome. He's he's a. I adore him. He's a sweetheart and a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I, I, I absolutely adore him. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, no, he was like oddly like. Still a little, little, little sensitive about that because I think I think he got a lot of shit when he was a kid. Oh, he did. That, 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 yeah. So I'm sure, like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure if he's resolved that yet. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah, like in his own mind. But at the same time, like I said, he's a sweet. So you still keep in touch with him? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we worked together on the Big Bang Theory two seasons ago. Oh, cool. And um, uh, it's the first time we had worked together since Stand by Me. We oh, we had 
we our paths had crossed a few times over the years, but just not very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time before Big Bang Theory that we were in the same place, um, one of the morning shows did a retrospective, like a, a 25 or 30 year retrospective on Stand By Me. Yeah. And we shot it at the, the Gary Marshall Theater in Toluca Lake. Mm -hmm. And they had Dreyfus and Corey and Jerry and Rob and me. Mm -hmm. um, and then Rob made them put up an empty chair for River, yeah, which I thought, go. which I thought was really. Wait, he couldn't make it. Yeah, it turns out that it turns out that he, he wasn't he, available. He wasn't available. <laughs> um, it was. I'm gonna and, have and, him on next. Was, that was, yeah. that was oh, my plan. I'm gonna, oh, do the you're gonna get the whole cast. But no, no, not Corey <laughs> Feldman. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, I I feel obligated to say that like I tease Corey and and I and mm. and um, uh, uh, I I have a tremendous amount of compassion and empathy for his experience mm -hmm. and his awful 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 parents mm -hmm. and what he went through as a child actor. Mm -hmm. um, and I sincerely wish him the best. We're not close, yeah. but I don't. I don't feel any negative emotions toward him or anything yeah. like that. Um, he was tough when we worked on that movie. Yeah, um, he was in a lot of pain. Really, and I remember asking in what Rob, kind of way? What do you mean? He was in a lot of emotional pain. You know, yeah. his his parents. I think in ways that you and I can relate to mm -hmm. were just about wringing out as much money out of him as possible yeah, yeah. and, and, and making him feel like he needed to be on stage all the time. Mm -hmm. Always and, being on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, and, and he, um, I feel like he doesn't know how to not be on. That's just his existence. He's never, that's, he's never found his switch. You that's know? the life that he's always lived. Yeah. And when we were on set and he was 15, um, that burns a lot of mental calories. It, at, you know, yeah, that's a great way to look yeah. at it. And um, he was kind of a bully to me. Yeah. Um, was just constantly teasing me. And, and uh, um, just, I remember saying to Rob, why did you cast this guy? Like, it's you know, a fucking like, like, like he's a dick. Yeah. Why did you cast him? And Rob said, I saw hundreds of actors and he was the one that had the rage. Mm-hmm. And I got and, him because he's kind of a dick. You know, and, you know. and it was, I mean, and, and I think one of the reasons I think Stand By Me endures and one of the reasons that I think it is so relatable to generations now. It's a leech is, scene when you pull a leech out of your, <laughs> it's your junk. That's such a, that's such yeah. a relatable experience. That's, that's, yeah, everyone just pulled a leech out of their junk. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it's that Rob Reiner cast four boys mm -hmm. who were who who were their characters. Yeah. And for the longest time, I thought the way I was like Gordy is that I just wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a storyteller. I thought that that was cool. Um, but it turns out that the way that I'm really like Gordy is he is invisible to his parents and mm -hmm. his father hates him. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what my life is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it took me until I was in my 40s to realize that. To realize, I yeah. think I wasn't willing to admit it. Because you didn't, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to, like, accept yeah. that reality about my life. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> when I watch that movie, and I watch it every few years, I'll stumble across it on yeah, cable, yeah. and I'll just, I'll just watch it, and I watch it objectively now. Yeah, I'm no, not... Yeah, you've separated yourself from it at this have, point. Have you ever gone and watched yourself as a kid? Uh, like... Yeah, I mean, I still, you know, I, I try to watch certain things objectively. Like, you know, I've, I've watched, like, you know, Home Alone or Uncle Buck or something like that, and I yeah. go, like, yeah, like, you know, like, no, like, I can, I can watch it objectively, but in general... <sighs> I just forgot that you were an Uncle Buck, and yeah. I just remembered you at that, the scene at the dinner table with John Candy, mm -hmm. where I think you say something like, I'm a kid, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah it's a kid, God. that's the job. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> such a good... I forgot that was you! Yeah, yeah. That's such a great scene! Yeah, yeah, I, I did do my whole dragnet thing, I, and I go, Yes! I had to memorize all those lines, and also... Rapid fire, so fast, and we did it like in like two takes. Like I kind of no just kidding. just ripped it off. Like in the amp, boom. Amazing. I was always really good at that. You was know? he accessible? Candy was he a gentle? Fellow? Yeah. Oh, he was great. He was great with the kids and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Like you know, yeah. It, it's 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 funny because you know, like I'm actually not in a lot of that movie, but it's like kind of memorable kind of spots. Yeah. But it's kind of like so like kind of swoop in, swoop out because you know, you gotta do this, gotta do the school thing. Of or course, that I remember. Stuff. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sure we're both well versed in uh, child labor laws. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Ah, uh, three hours of studio school, yes. twenty minutes at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so that's uh, conducive to getting an education. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but at least you're at least you're getting this one-on-one -on -one intenseness that like yeah. you can't cruise. 
that was the yeah. thing was that like you know like in, if I was in like my Catholic school there was like 30 other kids there yeah I could just cruise I could I could hide in the back and stuff like that but like when you have a tutor it's kind of like they can they can they, they can see you trying to like fake it and stuff like that I but owe I, I don't, so I don't, much I, to my set teacher yeah so much to her I, yeah I, I I had a really good one too like yeah. that like that like kind of like. There were certain times where you could tell she could tell I was having a bad day. Yeah. And she's like, I'm just gonna read you a book or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, that was cool. You know, yeah. But did you have like like one teacher that you kind of stuck with? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, my teacher's name was Marion Fife. Mm-hmm. And she so she came in um when when I was I actually did not ask for her when I started Star Trek. I asked for a different teacher because I thought she was too tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and then at 14, I guess I was such a dick. <laughs> um, and so entitled and just kind of a shitty kid, you know, oh, it's like Wesley Crusher. Um, well, no, <laughs> no like no, I joking, think, I don't think so. I think, I think that Wesley always tried to be, Wesley tried very hard to be mature and responsible yeah. and, and he tried to be an adult when yeah. he was a kid. Yeah. And I kind of went, I was sort of just like. I was kind of bratty, but I was in a ton of pain and I didn't know it. I didn't really? understand it at the time. I didn't understand like what was happening to me. I mean, were you and still enjoying the work? Or? I loved the work. I thought the work was great, but so the so work what, was, why were you in pain then? You know, like, uh, my dad was a giant bully to me. Oh, I know um, that one very well. Um, and my mother enabled it and then gaslighted me about it. Um, whenever I, <laughs> you're, and, you're preaching the choir. And, and, then, when, and then the, the very few times I tried to stand up to my dad when he bullied me my my mom would take his side and make me apologize yeah for standing up for myself Mm -hmm. so it was really hard and it hurt all the time and I struggled to relate to kids my own age because I had been around adults all the time. Yeah, and, and you're, you're not spending a lot of time around kids your own age. I, I mean, fuck, you're doing Star Trek. You're the only freaking kid on the show. Yeah, like, you know, I mean, just even right there. You know, I was uh, believe so, me, Home Alone. Like I'm like yes, there's like I have brothers and sisters. We have like one. You or two have one scene together, and that's it. I never, yeah, I don't fucking see them ever again. Yeah, like and, yeah, n- not, and then it's just you and the crew. Yes, for the entire movie, pretty much. Yeah, like and I, and people even forget like with the, Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. Like I'm actually only in like one scene with them like anything it's like no it's literally just me by myself yeah just doing that yeah you are literally carrying an entire picture yeah and like even if people aren't going out of their way to make sure that child you knows that Mm -hmm. child you still knows that you can feel it you feel the responsibility i might not have have the i might not have the emotional or actual vocabulary to to vocalize that or to process it but at the same time like it's there you know, yes. yeah, look, yeah, and it, it builds up subconsciously. Yeah, you know, yeah, and and so you started kind of lashing out, kind of thing. Like yeah, that. I think a little bit, and um, I sort of, I, I had this for 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 a real quick minute. I felt like I was just really fucking great, mm-hmm. and um, the person who I had asked to be the teacher uh, uh, called me aside one day and said, "I want you to know that I, this is my last day." Um, and you're real fucking hard to be with and you're you're really <laughs> like, broke like up with you. yeah i mean and he was just like you can't treat people the way you treat me and i remember thinking and i remember saying something like give me another chance and this it's person like, and, and, and this person was like nope yeah. and just left it was like i don't need this shit from you Oof. and marion came in and was like i'm not going to take any shit from you mm-hmm. and it was like it was like Eddie Olmos in Stand and Deliver. It was just like, I will not take shit from you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring out the best in you, and I'm going to believe in you. And she believed in me and held me accountable and nurtured me and guided me and supported me in ways that my 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 family just didn't. Yeah. And, oh, that's so cool. And she saw that I was deeply interested in history and that I was really interested in civics and that I really loved anything creative, writing, painting, photography. Yeah. Um, and she encouraged me I was to say, do those sorts yeah. of things. That's so, um, so cool. And then the, the subjects that I really struggled with, I really struggled with math. Mm-hmm. Uh, she worked real hard with me. And I remember one day in algebra in sophomore or junior year, I was just like, I was really struggling and I couldn't understand it. And I had this mental block and she said, I want you to approach this in a different way. You're treating this like a problem to be solved. Treat it like a puzzle to be solved Mm. because you love puzzles. Yeah, exactly. And And I thought... 
wow, you're right. Mm -hmm. And she said, these are just these variables and these, uh, and, and these, um, just uh, put the pieces laws, together. they're the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. Just put the puzzle yeah, together. Just plug, plug the right pieces in the right slots. You know, that's, and that's, it became clever. fun. Yeah. And I, and that's a key to teaching anyway. You yeah. Know? And it was, and that was when I realized I'd never had a good math teacher. Yeah. I had had these, like I was in Lutheran school, which is like Catholic school, but more judgmental. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, I went to Catholic school and boy, howdy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and if we didn't like a thing, the, uh, the, the, the faculty was just sort of like tough shit. Yeah. Did you, like, get, you get, get the ruler? You know, you get the, you get your ear pulled or whatever. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Like, they yeah. were just like, just do it. Yeah. yeah. So, Nobody helped me find a way into math. Mm -hmm. And so now it became something that you just, you didn't like to begin with. And they just made you just not like it. More. Yeah. They ground it into you. Yeah. And I also felt like I'm never going to use this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be an actor that's my what, whole life. That's what everyone says. Exactly. I don't have to work on this at all because I'm yeah. going to be an actor for my whole life and I'm mm -hmm. going to be famous and I'm going to be rich. And, exactly. And, and every movie I do is going to be and, like stand and, by and me. And I'm going to forget your name and like, Oh, yeah, I mean, stuff, I just, you know, I, yeah. and when I was, when I was 12, 13, 14, I really believed that because what I was getting was this relentless bullying from my father who like my father worked real hard to make me feel worthless mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and just weak. Yeah. And my mom worked really hard to extract whatever she could from me mm -hmm. and was real manipulative. Um, and, and, and just made me feel like the only thing that mattered was being famous. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do good work. Yes. I wanted Fame is a byproduct of good work. Is yeah. essentially the that's the philosophy that you know, yeah. Right. It's kind and, of yeah. And because of that, I just discarded. I was dismissive to anything that wasn't about that one path. Mm -hmm. Um I eventually grew out of it. Mm -hmm. Marion helped me grow out of it a lot and helped broaden my interests and then I did tons of independent study and mm -hmm. and uh uh did a lot of like college level classes my last 2 years of high school because I wanted to learn and mm -hmm. I wanted to I I figured like I'm not going to do this forever. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be stuck in my mom's world forever. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm not professionally, I still am a little bit emotionally. I'm working out of it. You know, right, it's yeah. a long term it's, healing that's process. A, those are forever things, man. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I mean, you find peace and all that kind of stuff, but no, I mean, it's there. It's there. Yeah. It, I, it, it's like a fart in an elevator. I mean, it's just fucking, <laughs> it's just fucking there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still waiting for those doors to open. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. But, you know, it's a, well, did your, um, did your father ever get physical with you? Was it like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, um, uh, I was playing. Do you remember when you could plug Game Boys together and play head-to-head -head Tetris? <laughs> oh, yes. So Hardwick and I did that all the time. Mm -hmm. So he was over at my house. Um, uh, and we were playing Tetris against each other <laughs> and we were lame. We were like 17 and, and we were just lame and being loud and, and, and being obnoxious and stupid. And my dad came into my room and screamed at me about it. Mm -hmm. So my dad had two, uh, he's doing it in front of your friend too. Yeah. Which is like to bawling. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and I, um, I remember at the time feeling like, 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 like my dad had two speeds. He had screaming at me and ignoring me. Mm -hmm. And so he comes down to do this and it happened so much that I just, I was just like, Oh, this shit again. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was humiliated. Yeah, of course he's and, doing it in front of your friend, you know? Yeah. And my, so my defense to that was to like blow him off. Like it didn't matter. And he grabbed me by my neck and picked me up off the floor. Christ. And then shook me Jeez. in front. It like, like, this close, right? Yeah, like yeah. we're, we're sitting three feet away from each arms other. Arms length from each other. Yeah, yeah, ar yeah. Arms length from, from Chris. Jeez. And I looked at Chris and Chris is like, Chris is embarrassed. No, he's probably, head, probably he's, a little afraid. He's putting his head down. Like, and he is staring at his Game Boy screen. And he's just like, <laughs> I'm the most intense Tetris player who's ever existed. You know? And, um, uh, and I remember saying, well, this is great. Just choke me in front of my friends. Yeah. No, exactly. and, and he yelled at me some more and then left. And we went right back to playing our games like that was totally normal. Yeah, exactly. And it was totally normal. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that's and, the problem. And it wasn't until I had my own children 
that I realized, holy shit, my dad abused the fuck out yeah, of yeah. me. They look, because yeah, because unacceptable. I, n- I never would put my hands on a person in anger. Anybody. Yeah. Like, I don't care who Literally it is. Your own fucking son. Your own child, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that was one of those times oh, where, where my mom made me apologize to my dad for not respecting him <laughs> uh, uh, in his house. Yeah, yeah. See, no, I... I, you know, I had similar kind of things, and yeah, no, my, my father was very good at hitting me in places that no one could see, because you know, this is the money maker, the face, yeah, of course. like you know, like that kind of thing, yeah. like you know, uh, you know, yeah, like he, like I have a couple scars on the back of my oh, head, Jesus, kind of thing, man. like you know, it's the way it is, yeah. Uh, um, but also, I don't have any fond memories of my father. I always knew, like, fuck that guy. Like that. yeah, I always like I never Same. had I never had any illusions that he was a good man or a good father or anything like that. I never really sought his approval or anything like that. It was I knew it was like when I turn eighteen. I'm gonna get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I had the same. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take my money and get the fuck out of here and like never speak to you again. Yeah. And thankfully he was out of the house by the time I was 14, which was great. You know, yeah. but like yeah, like but it was also like I knew in our war, my you know my war with my father that I was going to win. Yeah. I knew I was going to win uh, because I, I never had that confidence. See, I, I, I knew I was a better person than him. Yeah. That I was not going, I'm, everything that he's doing, I'm going to just do the opposite of. Yeah. Because he's a shitty person and I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to be, you know, like I, I'm going to learn from his mistakes and he's making a lot of them like with me and stuff, you know, because also he was a crazy person. Yeah. And the thing is I'm on the road all the time as a kid and I, you know, I needed a guardian and stuff like that. So my father was that. Yeah. So I was actually locked up. Like I'm, I'm third of seven kids, so like, but my mom would stay at home with the six other kids, yeah. And I'd be on the road, locked in these like motel rooms with a crazy person, yeah. You know, who was abusive verbally and physically and stuff like that. And yeah, it was just like, at the same time, I was like, I'm stronger than you. I'm better than you. It's, it's, you know, and that's it's incredible things- self awareness. Well, like that, that isn't that is that's you're very lucky that you had that that sense of self and yeah. I, I knew it's just like yeah. I, I like, there are certain times where like yeah, like I would you know he get physical with me and I just put my head down yeah and just like yeah like that because nothing you can do you know you're like 10 11 12 years old yeah. or whatever like yeah what, what am I gonna fight my dad like no I you- think that my parents told themselves that because he wasn't like slapping me or punching me that it was that it was okay yeah but yeah. his big thing to do was to poke me Oof. He would like get up in my face and poke me in my chest. That's so like demoralizing. And, and it's demeaning and it's yes. humiliating. And like he would poke me really hard in my sternum. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then, and it's just, like a high school bully thing to do. Like, you know, like, you know, just, I think that's who my father is. I think yeah. the man, the man who was my father was a high school bully who never grew out of it. Yeah. And my parents tell themselves that none of this is true. Oh, my uh, parents tell themselves that, that my story is a thing that I completely made up. Oh, I know this. Um, I know that story. Well, like that was the thing that pissed my father, uh, uh, pissed me off about my father the most was not the abuse or anything like that. But like, I'd be like in a shitty mood like, with him and he goes, what's wrong? And I said like, what you, you, you know, you, you uh, like talk shit about me in front of my friend. And then when I got upset, you said, what are you going to cry about it? Like he actually did that. Once. Yeah. And, and he was like, that didn't happen. Yeah. And I go, no, that did happen. I remember it because it scarred me. Like, you know, look, no, it hurt a lot. He's like, yeah. Didn't happen. You're overreacting. And, it's like, oh, and that was the you're part- overreacting was one I got all the time. And don't be so dramatic. Don't be so uh, dramatic. Or, or and also also uh, uh, something to indicate that the cameras aren't rolling. Yeah. Right. Something like my dad would go, OK, cut. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that was the thing that pissed me off the most yeah. was that he was going to sleep at night thinking that he was a good person, that he didn't do bad things. Yeah. That was the part that I couldn't stand. I could take I could take him hitting me, but the part that he thought, No, I'm a good guy. I'm a good dad. Like, you know, that was the part that fucking yeah. that, that slayed me. You know, yeah. I made efforts to I tried to have a um I tried to have a deep, heartfelt conversation with both of my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, How long ago was this? About a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I and I and I and I just laid. I said, "Listen, I want you to know that I'm not angry. You know, I've, you're going to feel attacked, but I'm not attacking you. I'm just laying out what my experience has been. Yeah, and this is how I feel, and, and this and is what I remember. I, and I would like to heal this, mm-hmm. right? And I laid out." just like four or five of the ways my dad was always abusive to me. And I laid out some of the ways that my mother 
was really manipulative to me mm-hmm. and, and, and enabled and, his and, and, behavior. Ena- and enabled. Yeah. 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 She, and, she watched him do that and yeah. didn't do anything about it. Yeah. That also drove me crazy too. And their response to that was, I sent this in a letter to them and their response was to, for my mother to ignore me for two and a half months. Mm-hmm. Um, and my father ignored me for about four months. The ostrich technique, just bury your head. And, <clears> yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and, and the then that guy goes away. So this thing that my mother does is she, ignores things, doesn't talk about them, waits some prescripted amount of time, and then says, I thought we moved past that. Yeah. It's the and, ostrich and I'm, and I'm like, but we never talked about it. Yeah. And, uh, and then when my father finally responded to me four and a half months later, he said, your mother wants me to email you. And, <laughs> and, and I was like, and then it was all this, and it was all this blaming of me. Mm-hmm. You know, denial and blaming and stuff. And, and when my mother finally got in touch, she was like, she says, she lists all these things that are more important than me. You know, these are all the things I was doing. This is why I didn't respond to you. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, um, gaslights me about my dad being abusive, says she has no idea and they're different people and, and she can't speak for all the things that he's doing. Uh, and then says, I, you know, of course I want to help you heal, but you have to understand you haven't been easy to deal with. <laughs> and I was like, none of this says, I hear you. I care about you. I want to, I, I, I want to, I want to do this together. You're not even asking for an, I'm sorry. You're not even asking for that. You're asking for an acknowledgement and a dialogue. Yeah. 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 And I, and they just couldn't do it. And that was when I realized nothing I can do or could have done mm-hmm. would change make, it. Would, would, would change this or make it different. Yeah. And it hurts a lot. And I'm in a lot of existential pain. Last night I was watching Supergirl last night <laughs> and, and I'm behind. So I'm in the third season and, uh, in the show, her sister and her sister's girlfriend are talking about getting married and they're really excited to get married. Her sister really wants to have children. Her sister's girlfriend does not want to have children. And, uh, it's this big thing and they go to a baby shower Mm -hmm. and her sister gets super upset and leaves. And there's this scene where her sister is talking about how much she wants to have a child and how much she wants to love a child and take that child to school and hold her when she gets hurt and give her all and give her love and raise her and take her places and share the world with her. And I'm watching Supergirl and you're, you're and, cheering up and I start to sob. Yes. I sobbed so hard, a deep, yeah. deep, deep inside my chest, existential wail just like, and thank goodness I was out in my game room away from the house. Cause I would have woken up my wife for sure. And I just cried out like, why didn't I get that? Yeah. Why, like, why, why, why? We get, we get one chance to have that person. Yeah. Like, there's two people in the world who get to be that for us. Yep. And, why couldn't I have just one? And, and, and I got none of it and I was just sobbing. So I had to take my glasses off cause mm-hmm. I was crying so hard. My glasses fogged up. Mm-hmm. I had to pause the thing. And then I sat there and honestly it felt really good and cathartic yeah. to just get it out, sob it out yep. for like 10 straight minutes. Yeah. And like, I realized as I was watching this last night that, so I have friends that are having babies now Mm -hmm. and uh, my kids are grown and I adore my children and they're, they're great. And I'm a good dad and, 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 and we're close and it's awesome. You don't Um, poke them in the chest. I don't, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but like my friends are having uh, babies right now. My friend Christina just had a baby and she's talking about how much she loves him and how she wants everything for him and how she wants to protect him from the evils in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and like, all I can think about is my parents looked at six year old me and said, put him to work, put him to work. Okay. Someone's going to earn ring, ring out of him, whatever we can. Like, like it was, and I, the part of me that's empathetic and compassionate, the part of me who's a writer who Mm -hmm. like tries to understand the part of me, that's an actor who needs to justify even the worst behavior because everyone feels they're justified from their point of view. Yeah, of course. Right. Thinks about, objectively how my mother was raised by an abusive alcoholic and a, and a mother who never supported her. And she always wanted to be a model and an actor. Mm -hmm. So when she had a kid, she thought, well, I'm going to give that kid what I wanted. 
And she wanted and needed it so much that she was incapable of understanding that it's not what I wanted and needed. Mm -hmm. Even when I was a kid, the number of times I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to be a kid. Yep. Could I please just be a kid? Yeah. I don't want to go on I know that conversation. I don't want to go to work. Yep. I just want to be a kid. Yep. I, I, I've been to school since first grade. Can I, can I, can I, uh, can I just do one year of school? I just want to go to summer can, camp. Can I just do that? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. no, believe me, I had, I had that conversation many a time. Yeah. Kind of thing. Cause my father was, a, my, it was with me. It was my father. My father was a ballet dancer. So next thing you know, I was a ballet dancer. Yeah. You know, my, my father was an actor. So like, yeah, shoved me into there, that yeah. kind of thing. And like, look, I was good. And I was, you know, I was an attention whore and all that kind of stuff. Of course. So it worked. It was a good fit, generally. But at we the same would time. not be the successful child actors we were if we didn't. If we didn't, if we weren't good at it. Yeah, exactly. If we didn't fit into those well, things. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you did the circuit for a while and you see all those kids and they're all lined up and you did yeah. these cattle calls like, yeah. for fucking Oreo commercials or yeah. whatever that kind of stuff. It's how I know Seth Green. Yeah. Seth and I met on commercial auditions <laughs> in like in, in the early 80s. Yep. Um, and just, and, yep. and he was one of those guys that like, he got it. Yeah. He understood good, like, really like, 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 yeah. like how the whole thing worked. And he really wanted to be there. Yeah. He wanted and it. He really yeah, wanted he wasn't it. Being and pushed, you know? No. And like, I really liked him. Yeah. And I felt like he was cool and, mm -hmm. and, uh, I liked being around him. Yeah. Um, yeah. it was all these other kids who just clearly didn't want to be there. And my yeah. mom would always point out to me how she wasn't the stage mother the other stage mothers they, they, were. They all, they all say that. Yeah. They, no boy. stage mother or stage father is a stage mother, stage father. It's yeah. never. Like, you yeah. know, I'm different than them kind of thing. It's yeah. like, yeah, just... And I, and I think that she believes it. Yeah. I think she really, really believes yeah. it. And, and in my efforts... I think they to, all believe it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think that... Because the because the and I have to believe that because the alternative is yes I knew how much you hated it and I didn't I, care yeah exactly and the, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm unwilling to admit that yeah mm. and I'm, I'm even not, if it's true uh, whether that's true or not it doesn't change what my experience was yeah and I have to live with the reality of what my experience was there it is right so there. I would rather choose the less hurtful uh, uh, <laughs> option yeah, than, yeah. You know, than, than the other one. Yeah. Uh, we have to take a little commercial break uh, right now and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Hello and welcome to Meditation Minute. I'm your guide, Louis Prada. Thank you for allowing me to kickstart your day with some positive energy because today's meditation is made specifically to do first thing in the morning before you've even gotten out of bed. Let's get right to it. First, I want you to sit up straight in your bed with your legs crossed. It's okay if you feel a little groggy right now. By the end, you'll feel like you've already had your morning coffee. Now, take a deep breath in and... Get dressed, brush your teeth, go to work. You don't have the luxury to sit around in the morning. Get your ass in gear. Traffic is building. You're already late for your life sentence as a slave in the machine of capitalism that's locked you into its Sisyphean ascent of a mountain called success, and you'll never reach its peak. I hope this dire wake-up call to get your priorities straight has brought you the serenity you seek. My name is Louis Prada, and this has been Meditation Minute. Namaste. Let, 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 let's get back on the trolley. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Keep those mics hot. Yeah. 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 So um, we have not, we, we, we touched on it. Yeah. Star Trek. Yeah. Like I said, I've, I have seen every episode of everything. Yeah. Including the bad ones. I actually haven't been watching Discovery or anything like that. Oh, it Discovery's is, great. Is it? It's terrific. I've been it's hearing its own things. show. I've been hearing mixed things. It's its own show. I think, so, this is the way I'm able to enjoy it. Uh, I allow it to be its, its own show with its own characters telling its own stories that shares um, a few really important pieces of the world that was built in the 60s 
that yeah. I was part of in the nineties. Gotcha. Like mm-hmm. that's, I, I, it's not a sequel. I don't view it as a prequel. Um, they, they, they just some, jump forward in time, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And some of the characters are, are, you know, like you've got Pike and you've got Spock, um, mm-hmm. but they are so well drawn that they can exist entirely on their own outside of the continuity that we've known okay. since the sixties. Um, and I, I really like it. And, and it is one of the things I, I love about it is like every incarnation of Star Trek before it, it's incredibly progressive and it really reflects the time in which it was made. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, I'm working on a talk that's titled, we need Star Trek now more than ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's have, about which... how in 1967, 68, like when when the world when the Vietnam War was out of control and and yeah, Watergate you know, the was, world... was spinning up. You and, know, we were right. like two minutes to midnight around yeah, that time. And yeah, and we're there again. Mm-hmm. And uh, we need something to remind us what is possible. Yeah. Uh, when we work through the shit we are in right now. Mm-hmm. And but I without feel... changing the Klingons, though, too much. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to tinker with them too yeah, much. Yeah, don't mess with them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm watching Deep Space Nine for the first time. Oh, you, oh okay, because that's a great show. <clears throat> it's amazing. So Max Temkin, mm-hmm. uh, one of the co-creators of Cards Against Humanity uh, and a great writer in his own right, he put up a couple of episode guides. Uh-huh, Here's cool. how to watch Star Trek The Next Generation in 40 hours. Mm-hmm. So he picked the 40 best episodes of Next Generation and said, if you want to yeah. get a sense of, like, you want an overview of this series. Yeah. You want Darmok. You want Yesterday's Enterprise. Yeah. That- yeah, yeah, he's like, like yeah, it's like, like you can out. avoid Angel One, yes. uh, right? You know, like, <laughs> like, like you, you can skip most of the first season. You can skip the entire, except for Measure of a Man, you know. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Which yeah. I think is season two. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like, you know, the, there's this joke, right? If you turn on Star Trek: The Next Generation and Riker doesn't have a beard, keep going. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he did a similar guide for Deep Space Nine. Yeah. And he said, but Deep Space Nine is so good that you can't whittle it down to 40 hours. He whittles, whittles it down to like 78 or 87. I can't get the numbers yeah. right in my head. Um, so uh, uh, I started watching it because Aaron Eisenberg, who played Nog, was just a, passed. he just passed away. Yeah. And he was a friend of mine. Aaron and I did a movie in uh, around 1992. Three called The Liars Club, a Corman movie. Mm-hmm. Not a great movie, not a terrible movie. It's a Corman movie. It's a Corman movie. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and uh, we became friends immediately. Um, he I heard nothing but sweet things about him. Yeah. Everything you've heard is true. Yeah. He was a deeply, deeply kind, intelligent, compassionate, gentle man. Short. And he was short. Yeah. Um, and, and he was terrific. So, you know, we, we did this movie. We became friends. We stayed friends for a few years. And then we just sort of lost touch. Um, we just sort of drifted away. That, like, a consequence of my mental illness, my depression and anxiety, is that before I was in treatment and before I was medicated, I would feel like I don't deserve good things. So if there were good mm-hmm. relationships in my life, I would sabotage them or yeah. I would just wouldn't take care of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and also and sets are like summer camp, man. Very much. You know, it's very, like, very, we'll, very we'll much. Write, yeah. we'll, I'll, I'll write you every we'll day. We'll be friends forever and yeah. then you're on the next thing and you forget. And yeah, that's very happens. true. That's you know, very yeah. true. So that, that's kind of the nature of the beast. Yeah. Too. It's a tragedy. It's also a lovely thing because you actually have a lot of these. We get uh, to form these incredibly intimate relationships yeah. that last for a, for a minute. Yeah. But at the same time, you can pick up right where you left off too, though. And that was our relationship. I was about to say, you probably, you've probably done some conventions and things like that. So you probably yeah. bumping into them. So when Deep Space Nine started, we were still doing Next Generation. And I felt just this weird, irrational sibling rivalry. <laughs> and and I was like, ride or die for Next Generation. I remember when that 80s show came out. Well, that 70s show was on. And yeah. I'm telling you, all those kids fucking hated the 80s show kids. Yeah, of course <laughs> you did. Because it's just because now the producers treat them like they're the new baby. Yeah, exactly. They're cutting, they're cutting our budget to give them more effects. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, they're like, they're poaching our writers. Yeah, yeah, Right? Yeah. Like it was, they clearly had, you know, and the producers, Rick Berman, who was the executive producer of Next Generation, mm-hmm. was a monster. And he was really... I Heard not he, great things. He was about, really terrible. To listen, me. I watch a lot of the red letter media, like kind of stuff, and yeah. everything like that. Like, yeah, he, they they rip. Uh, they they yeah, rip Berman. Was, Same thing with SF Debris. That that reviewer, he's great. Oh he, yeah. yeah. So yeah. so Berman was not a really was not a particularly good person, and so I just felt like. I'm just going to turn my back on this, you know, and I'm going to be ride or die for next generation. Yeah. I didn't even know Aaron was on it years later. This is in the late nineties. Well, cause he's wearing, cause he's not, he's wearing all that shit on yeah. him. So he's a Ferengi. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So years later, 
we ran into each other at a convention and I was like, what the fuck are you doing here? What the fuck are you doing here? And he's like, I'm Nog. And I was like, oh my God. We reconnected. (laughs) Awesome. And then we just, you know, we talked every now and then and we saw each other at cons and we always picked up right where we left off. Mm -hmm. And I just took for granted that he was going to be there. You know, like we do, right? Of course. And, And it was really out of nowhere that he died. Yeah. And did they even and, announce and, what it was even? Uh, it was something with his kidneys. I was about to say kidneys, I think is um, usually what, what it and is. I, I wrote about it. And, and one of the things I said, and I believe this very firmly is that the sun just shines a little less bright because he's not around anymore. Yeah. He just, his kindness and his light in the world. And I'm bummed that he didn't get to live long enough to see Trump go away. <laughs> like, yeah. I feel like that like same thing for Elijah Cummings you, what, the day we're recording this Elijah Cummings died this morning oh goodness and and uh, he doesn't get to see how this ends right <laughs> yeah, so yeah. like like there were times in my in my youth where I was suicidal mm-hmm. and one of the things that saved me was this waiting sense for that Trump? like no, I, no. <laughs> one of the waiting, things that saved me was like for Trump what, to be what, impeached. one of the things that saved me was like I just want to see how it ends. Yeah. I want to know what the future is. Yeah. Right? Like I, I want to go there. If I could go to sleep for a hundred years, yeah. I would do that in a heartbeat. But I want even, but I want to but thought. I want to see what tomorrow is. Like, you know, but, I want to see what the next, you know, yeah. yeah. What, what what's gonna how this is all gonna play out. You know, exactly. You know? mm. So I thought a great way to remember Aaron would just be to watch his work. Mm-hmm. And that would be a great opportunity to experience Deep Space Nine for the first time. Yeah, so I took Max's on. guide. Yeah, I'm in season two. I'm I'm about halfway through season two on his guide, mm-hmm. and I am blown away by each episode. It gets better too. I've heard that that season like five, especially. Yeah, is that's, fucking, this is this is all I have ever heard. It's aces. This is all I have ever heard. All I have ever heard is that it just gets better and better and better, mm-hmm. and. Last have, season's a little soft, but it's not bad. But like I'm telling you, that that, that four, five, six. Yeah, I'm I'm I I am jealous of you because you're. I've heard to see, that too. That, that you, you get to see it for the first you get time. To see it for the first time. Yeah. Yep. Um. The the episode I watched last night had a woman, an amazing actor, and her character comes from a planet with extremely low gravity, mm-hmm. and Bashir builds her what's effectively a motorized wheelchair because she can't exist in the same normal one yeah. gravity environment that humans exist in, mm-hmm. and she is. Um, she's really abrasive because people are constantly treating her like she's weak. When she's not weak, yeah. she just is from a different environment with different gravity. Yeah. The way they handled her disability, the way they handled her sense of self, the way they handled her leaning into what makes her special. That's Star oh, Trek. That's Star Trek. That is Star Trek. Oh man. The representation, mm-hmm. the, the, them saying in the 24th century, how the fuck does, is this space station not accessible? Yeah. And O'Brien saying Cardassians, man, they didn't think about it. Mm-hmm. Cardassians are shit. Yeah. They don't think about what, <laughs> about other people. They're selfish. They're terrible. Mm-hmm. It's this amazing commentary. It's great. And it's just, ah, uh, and it's so Star Trek. It's the most yes. Star Trek episode of Deep Space Nine. It's- it's what far. you want it to be. Oh God, yes. it was so good. And every time I, so I have a rule that I don't binge shows. Oh, see, I binge. That's all I do. That's, I can't do that's it. That's why I'm waiting on Discovery. I'm waiting until it's like done. Then you'll watch, I'm all, of watch it. all of it. That's what I did with Lost. So, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I know, me too. <laughs> that's time you can't get back. I know, <laughs> but it's okay. It's a, it it's started a, out with such promise. I know, but then Those, I, but I have to know. <laughs> I have to know what the smoke monster Spo- is. Spoiler alert, you're never going to find <laughs> out. I know. But so, I, I already finished it. I'm, it's too <laughs> late. Too late for me. But everyone else listening, don't do what I did, kids. Uh, I, have, I have this rule that I don't binge because I feel like binging something is like racing through a meal. You won't be hungry anymore. But also, but you're not appreciating. But you don't taste it. Yeah. No, and it's true. Because honestly, like I can't remember like... 60% of lost. That's fine. Yeah. No, just, but that's okay. okay. In this case, it worked out for you. <laughs> yeah, but also, so may, maybe I'll you're, never... maybe you're sh- talking about the exception, which proves my rule. Yeah. But I'll, I'll never have the time back, you know, yeah, you know to true. watch something else better or, but, or I don't know, like build a boat or like, you know, uh, work at a, work at an animal shelter. Or wash the dishes. Or just wash the dishes. Or vacuum. Yeah. Or fold clothes. Yes. No, no. We're going full loss yeah, this yeah. weekend. <laughs> um, uh, at the end of every episode of Deep Space Nine, I want to immediately start watching the next one. Yeah. And I make myself wait. Oh, okay. Uh, Are and, you doing a one a day or kind of thing? I'm a one a day or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I might accelerate a little bit and go two a day to get through season two because Max says that season three is when it starts to get good. Yeah. That's when it's when they figure out what they are. But I guess 
guess it's season five where they finally let Avery shave his head. And, uh, I think so. Yeah, and he becomes a captain. Yeah, okay. and that is apparently, according to Deep Space Nine fans, that moment that's like Riker growing the beard on Next Gen. <laughs> uh, that it's like this is who we are. Yeah, I I, I think it's it's not as stark of a difference. Yeah, but I, I can see that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You ever watch a, you ever watch a Voyager or Enterprise? I I tried. I tried with, real with both of them. With both of them, I tried <laughs> yeah. real hard. I have friends on both shows. Yeah. I tried real hard. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure you've met a lot of all you, of them because you yeah. do conventions and things. Yeah, like that. I do. Yeah. I do about five a year. Yeah. Um, and when I was younger, I really struggled with that. I felt like I shouldn't be doing this. I should be doing movies instead. Mm -hmm. And I finally accepted that my career as an actor did not land in movies like I wanted it to. Mm -hmm. um, it landed in genre television. And I'm good there. I'm successful there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, ha I make an impact there. And I'm really happy to live there. Uh, See, I, I because it's not the most important thing in my world like it yeah, once was. Exactly. Exactly. And also, I think your career would have been a lot different um, if that plot hole in a uh, toy, toy, toy soldiers. soldiers. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was that moment where the Hollywood was just like, everything, forget it. Everything would have been different if yeah. they just put all the plans on the plane and just flew it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's it uh, now, but now you're relegated to uh, genre television, which I, I, I don't, I, I, don't I don't view think, it as being relegated. I was just, I was about to correct myself. Yeah. It's like, no, I, I'm, I'm being no, sarcastic I, about yeah. like, yeah, how you feel about it. But it's like, no, man, you no, I, I, stuff, I love it. Man. And it's very much like, no, you, you are, you are a part of a genre show, but that's, that's, that's not that's not defining. I think that it's similar to writing where someone maybe wants to be a novelist and they become a comic book writer instead. Mm -hmm. You're not doing work that's less than. Mm -hmm. You're 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 not doing work that's disposable. You're telling great stories. Yeah. You're entertaining people. And one of the things I love about going to the five or so conventions I do a year is I finally get to interact with the audience I've entertained because I don't, get to, work, I don't get to work in the theater. Mm -hmm. when, when Hardwick was doing At Midnight, he got to be in front of an audience of 100 people every, uh, five days a week yeah. who loved his jokes and fed mm -hmm. like the thing that makes you a comedian, that makes you a performer. Yeah, yeah. You know, The guys that do the five-day-a-week talk shows, they get to have an audience every yeah. single day. I get to meet my audience five-ish times a year, and I love it. Yeah. It's really nice. It's nice to know that. And also, I love the stuff that I work on. Yeah. So, like... Like, and I've, like I've noticed if, that. if I ever get to go and work on Supergirl, if I <laughs> if I ever get to go Big Bang um, Theory, and even. when I got to work on the Big Bang yeah. Theory, if, if I ever get to work on a show like Mind Hunter, if I ever get to work on on uh, on something like Star Trek Discovery or Star Trek Picard, these are things that I love, yeah. right? And it's kind of like like it's cool that there is a non-zero chance that I'll get to do those things with my life, yeah. No, exactly. And it, it seems like, yeah, especially in the last, I don't know, it's over a decade that you've really embraced that. It seems like, you know, just yeah. from, from an outsider looking in kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I think like, a big part of that is just maturing. Yeah. And, and. So um, cause you try to run away from it. I mean, believe me, I try to run away from certain things in my past, yeah. you know, I mean, just cause, and also it's funny, you're running away from things in your past that are so public. It's like, yeah. what the fuck are you running away from, dude? Look, it's there. It exists. It's, it's, it's such know, a, it's, it's a forever thing. It's like yeah. a tattoo, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's so challenging I like I my favorite episode of Next Generation by like several orders of magnitude is Tapestry. Oh um, yeah. Because I have a ton of pain and regret in my life, but it's part of the tapestry of my yeah. life. And if I plucked that thread, the whole thing would, would unravel. You wouldn't be who you are today and you like you, you know, yeah. and that's it's a, like, yeah. It's a, you know, all things happen for a reason almost. Exactly. Kind of, yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. So I love, I love that episode and, and I love how it reaffirmed for me that it's okay to have these pieces of my life that feel painful, that feel, that I feel bad about. But I was, um, uh, on Saturday, I'm, uh, getting to do this thing with Felicia Day where we're doing a conversation about her new book, which is called Embrace Your Weird. And it's a book about finding your creativity, letting your creativity out, mm -hmm. letting yourself build whatever you want to build creatively, however it is. And it's full of excellence. Exercises. It's a book you're supposed to like. Just you're supposed to wreck this book. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so which you, is really you're fun. You're supposed to blank. write in it yeah, yeah. and draw in it and all that. And I went through this chapter that was all about like go through your childhood and go through your childhood memories. And I was just like, oh, oh I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. I tried and I got super depressed.
chest <laughs> and I just felt so bad. And I was like, I can't do this. I was like, Oh, this is a trigger. I understand what a trigger is. Yeah. So I skipped the, I read the chapter. I skipped the exercises mm-hmm. and I was like, I don't need to visit that piece of my life right now. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll, 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 I'll get there. Yeah. Right. Um, but at, at this moment, this is not where I need to be. Mm-hmm. And it's weird when I talk about, when I talk about my childhood, when I talk about what, you know, my, my experiences are, um, one of the reasons I talk about it honestly and frankly is because I know there are other people who are experiencing the same thing. Yeah. I know there are other people who, who experienced it and not just actors. It's okay. Even though it's not okay. You know what I mean? Like what happened to you is not okay, but it's, it's okay. There's going to be okay. There's a thing we say in the mental health community that it's okay to not be okay. Yes. Um, and one of the reasons I talk about it is, um, uh, is, is so other people, maybe who are adults who are survivors of childhood trauma, Mm -hmm. um, or teenagers who are currently experiencing it right now feel less alone. And I know there are people who look up to me and I know there are people who look at me and see a successful person and I can see objectively that success, but like also from inside my head, like it's just a lot of sadness and a lot of pain Mm -hmm. and, and, um, by, by talking about it and, and, and by refusing to be ashamed of it and, and like, like hold it all inside, yeah. um, I'm healing myself. I read somewhere, uh, I read, I read somewhere a person saying, I'm using my compassion to be compassionate for others to heal myself. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the ways I try to do my daily thing. Like the thing that I do every day is I try very hard to be the person I always needed in the world. Mm-hmm. I try to be that person for other people. So then I am that person it feeds for myself you. and it feeds you and it makes me feel like it makes me feel like I'm not a victim. It makes me feel like a survivor. Yeah, exactly. It makes you strong. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, we have to take one more commercial break. Uh, so we'll be back in well, whatever, however many minutes. All right. We're, and we're back. We're back. We were just actually just talking about um, uh, Star Trek Picard. Are you excited? I'm super excited. Yeah. I'm more excited for that than I've been for anything related to Star Trek since I was on it. How is Data aged? I mean, like, how, how, how can we explain I that? I asked Brent about that, and he said they're going to digitally retouch his face to make him look younger. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, um, we have the technology. We sure do. Yeah. <laughs> the um, Six Million Dollar Man style. Yeah. yeah, which is weird. That's one of the things I really love about Supergirl. They spend so much money on their visual effects mm-hmm. that I feel like I'm watching a film every week. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I've not gotten to that Arrowverse at all. Are you? Do you watch all of those? I don't. I only watch Supergirl. Well, because they also... Aren't they doing a... What, they're Christmas doing Zone Crisis Infinite? on Infinite Earth. So yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that comic, you know. So yeah, it's, me too. Yeah, so but also at the same time, I'm also holding my breath where it's like, oh, it's CW's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, whereas like, like that's their Infinity Crisis essentially. You yeah, know, you know that that's that's like that's their Infinity War yeah. story. And I feel like, are they blowing their wad in the Arrowverse with it? You no know, kind of thing. I know I don't that, really watch that, those shows. that it's so it's going to be on all of their shows. Yeah, it's, it's, the, a, it's a huge it's, crossover. It's a event. massive. No, I crossover think they're doing event. it the best they can. It sounds yeah. like you know. Yeah. You know, I, I have faith in the people who are in charge of it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I know a couple of them and they get it. Yeah. And I, and I know that they're going to do the very best that they can. I know. It just, I would love to, to see it. I just love to see it at like the $300 million kind of budget oh, kind I know, of thing. Right? Like, that's what I would like to see. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, you know, just, uh, uh, so you're a comic fan. I'm a huge comic fan. That I figure, you know, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. started out reading the like the ones that I was that I loved. I loved the horror comics mm-hmm. that I would get off the spinning rack at the drugstore when yep. I was a little kid. So Vault of Horror, Vault of Mystery, um, that was your gateway. The Ghost Stories, uh, Ripley's mm-hmm. Believe It or Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that. A lot of those gold key comics that were <laughs> just like that were like ghost stories and things like that. I loved those. Um, and then I read superhero comics not very long, like probably from like maybe 86 to 88. Um, I was super into justice league and fantastic four. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a little bit into X-Men, but not that much. Yeah. Those are, that's like almost, that's like pre dark ages kind of thing before Rob Liefeld came around and shit in everyone's pie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, and, and around that time around 88, 89 DC, um, started what they called the prestige format and the new format, which became vertigo. Mm-hmm. And, okay, yeah, yeah. and that was Sandman, Hellblazer, Swamp Thing, yeah, Animal yeah. Man, Constantine. Uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Hell, yeah. yeah. It was, it was all, it was all of those 
dark comics that felt like they were written for adults. DC after dark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling at that time, like I just made a decision then superheroes were for kids and mm-hmm. these comics and Sandman was for adults. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that was all that I would read forever. And then I got back into superhero comics, maybe around 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't read them weekly. I had to actually, had to actually go to just reading trades. Apo- I yeah. apologize to my friends who are creators in the industry. Cause I know that those of us who wait for trades are not good for your bottom line. And I know that I do the same thing that, we're, that we're not good for comic shops, but the alternative is I read single issues digitally, which I don't want to do. I just don't yeah. have any place to put comic books anymore. Yeah. yeah. So um, I uh, I just wait for trades now. And, that's, that's what I do too. That's and, kind of I, then, I follow it. Yeah, you know, me like too. I still follow it, uh, but no, I wait for the trade. I to guess come out. reading a trade is kind of like binging a comic book. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I went. I just so I knew that they were going to do this Crisis on Infinite Earths on CW. So mm-hmm. I went and bought the Crisis on yes. Infinite Earths yeah. trade. Mm-hmm. I haven't read it since I was like thirteen, mm-hmm. and I don't remember anything oh, cool. about it. So it's really, really fun to read oh, it now. Oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. Give me a, uh, so how do you feel about all these, uh, about Marvel movies? You know, what, what, what like, I like most of them. Um, I, uh, do you like go on opening weekend? I don't. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy going to a movie theater. Me neither. I don't, and I, 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 I like, I like the soft pretzels and the cheese. That's, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's my favorite part of the movie going experience. I like when I go to a screening Mm-hmm. Because the people in the audience are invested in the picture yeah. and they're respectful and they don't talk and they don't use their phones. And I know that I sound like an old man yelling at a cloud when I, when I say this, but it drives me fucking crazy yeah. that people won't leave their fucking phones off in a movie theater. Yep. Like you're not in your fucking house. Yes. And you, if you cannot be away from texting your fucking friends for 97 minutes. Yeah then don't go to the movies and it drives me crazy. And it drives me crazy that movie theaters, single screen movie theaters that feel special Mm -hmm. where it felt like you were going almost to a house of worship. Like those Mm -hmm. don't really exist anymore. What's left are fast food style multiplexes. Go, go Yeah, Get them in, get them out. And, 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 and you got to get there 25 minutes early to get a seat that, that isn't in the first six rows. Yeah. And then you have to sit through and then you're a captive audience for 25 minutes of commercials for shit you don't care about. If I were younger, I probably would just accept this as normal and I would have ways to cope exactly, with it. Because it's what's always existed. Like, yes. But I remember when you went to a movie and it was special. Yes. I remember when it was just one screen. You were quite respectful. And, and, it, and, it, and it really meant something. It Back wasn't, in my day. Yeah, right? Yeah, and this no, is where I yeah. feel like an old man yelling at a cloud yeah, or someone yeah. complaining about Elvis's hips. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> yeah. you're, it wasn't just a big screen TV. Like, mm-hmm. it was a really special cinematic experience. Yeah, no, it's a big as, deal. As the gap between what happens in movies and what's what happens on TV gets smaller and smaller and smaller, mm-hmm. I just have less reason to go to the movies. Yeah, and, like, I'll, I'll wait it out. It's, like, it's also, they, they turn over these things into digital in, like, two or three months. Yeah. I, I can wait two or three months to watch yeah. Spider-Man Homecoming. I'm yeah. totally fine with that. And then I have a great time watching yes. it. I love it. I watch it with friends. Mm-hmm. We have we like have dinner. And I make my own soft pretzels and cheese. Nice. It's great. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, a, a couple of my friends are, you know, they're fancy, successful TV people. Mm-hmm. So they have screening rooms. Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. And we so go, good. we go to the screening room and some like have, have yeah. an actual movie, there you go. movie experience. And mm-hmm. I really, really, really love it. And I know how bougie that sounds. No, but um, still. But if, if there were, if we could all agree, if we could all agree that if you go to this showing at this theater, you're gonna just shut the fuck up and watch the movie. Yeah. I would always go to that. I would go to that every single time. Yeah. And I would have a great time doing well, do it. Do you watch, uh, uh, like, what do you think, feel about those uh, DC movies? Huh? Huh? I think they're awful. <laughs> I think they're fucking awful. I too. think they're terrible. I, I think, really want them to be good. I, every so time. do I. I think James Gunn's Suicide Squad's gonna be great. Uh, I'm holding my breath on that. But yeah, no, in a good way. Yeah. Kind of thing. I mean, I have just, I have zero faith. In, I mean, I watched Joker. Uh, uh, recently, yeah. And How is it? What did you it's think? Good. It's good. Well, Keen Phoenix is really good in it. Yeah. Have you seen it? I I haven't. I am. He's really good in it. It's and it's a solid movie. It's solid. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it's yeah. Like it. There's a lot of like weird like 
hype or like anti hype about it. Where yeah. it's like, oh, it condones violence and things right. like that. Don't I mean, don't believe any of the hype. I mean, people Joaquin have been Phoenix saying that about solid. movies forever. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just it's just like people are predicting the end of the world for two thousand years. People yeah. have people have been predicting that that music's going to ruin a generation and forever like, and ever. A, and we're in an extra sensitive kind of like time right yeah. now with everything that's going on in the world and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I can see why people are being a little like sensitive. But at the same time, it's like no, it's it's the violence is kind of a part of the story. Like yeah. that's kind of what they're trying to tell. So, you know, sorry that violence existed, but you know, like it's like Joker didn't come up with it. They didn't invent violence. Look at you. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. And I say this as a person who bought every variant cover of, um, uh, 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 the killing joke. I was just about to say killing joke. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I bought every variant cover of it. I still have them. Mm-hmm. I, I like, I love that comic. And, yeah, yeah. And, and I was, I was the world's number one Batman fan for a while. Oh yeah. Um, I'm bored with the Joker. I've yeah. just, they've told that character's story so many times. Yeah. And like Heath Ledger really nailed it. And all he stuff. really, really it's did. Every time, I watch that movie about once a year. I'm not even a big Batman mark or anything like yeah. that. But I don't even like that movie. I just like his performance just, in it. Every, every scene he's in, it's like you can just fast forward through everything else. Yeah. Like, you know, he's that great in it. You know? yeah. But no, Joaquin Phoenix actually, like, every time, like, it's, well, you know, it's Heath Ledger's a hard act to follow yeah. kind of thing. Like, yeah, like that's well, why I would, never, a, I would never play the Joker. Because I don't want to fucking follow that act kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, why would it, you know? And Jared Leto was, was, was a joker. He was a joker. That is a true statement. <laughs> yes, yes. That is an absolutely true mm-hmm. statement. But Joaquin Phoenix, he, he, he's able to make it his own and make it really, really good. Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I do recommend it. Look, yeah. uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know him at all. When River died, I lost contact with their family. Um, I have tremendous respect for him as an actor. I think he, he is killed, one of yeah. the great actors. He's one of the great actors of his generation. Yeah, he really kills um, it. Yeah. And I am happy for him that yeah. he has the success and the respect that I think River would have right now if he were still alive. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, River would have had, like, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, career Absolutely. But time, times five. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. He, he was the one, when we did Stand By Me, we all knew it. He was pegged, you know, yeah, pegged we for success. We all knew that, that, like, we all knew that we were making a special movie, but mm-hmm. we knew that we were seeing the beginning of someone who was going to win every Academy Award. Mm-hmm. We saw someone who was going to be a generational mm-hmm. performer. Yeah. He yeah. Was, like, he, he was, he was going to have the Tom Hanks career. He was going to have the Leonardo DiCaprio career. Mm-hmm. He was going to have the Philip Seymour Hoffman career. Yep. Like, he was definitely headed in that direction. Well, he kind of had the Philip Seymour Hoffman career. He no, he had, did. he had the ending. Yeah. Oh, too soon. Sorry. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can do gallows humor. It's okay. all right. Okay, it's good. okay. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> well, it, it was too soon to make River Phoenix jokes. Uh, <laughs> For some of us, it'll always be too soon. I know. Um, I know. Because he was a, you know, he's, because he was, he was such a, a lovely human being. And I was, I was so looking forward to his work, his I know. future work. Like, yeah. It's weird to me that my kids are older than he ever was shit how old are your freaking kids 27 and uh 30 oh huh, you started started young didn't you my wife started young so she had she had our first son a week before her 20th we a week after no week before her 20th birthday gotcha she had her second son two weeks after her 22nd birthday uh she's three years older than me i met them when they were four and six okay there you go um, so i raised them their whole life yeah i was gonna say um, yeah, yeah and and uh and they have their i you know, we had, it was hard. Her ex-husband was real vindictive and was constantly mm. dragging us through court and really tried really, really hard to drive a wedge between me and the kids. Mm-hmm. And, uh, thankfully, um, uh, he was never successful. Well, and the kids and I are super, super close now. That's awesome. And, and uh, I mean, they're not kids, they're adults. Uh, my, my yeah, son, my, my older son and I were talking about my eventual grandchildren today. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and he was talking about how fucked up the world is and how he really wants to have kids. Seriously. One of your, one of your kids is as old as my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, geez. <laughs> it freaks me out when I think that river's life ended so early. Yeah. And I remember being 23 and feeling like I'm so old and I'm so, I've yeah. been through so yeah, much. We're, and, we're, and, we're all so know, fucking smart when we're that's in like, 20s. I think there's, there's that, there's. I'm trying to figure out the exact correct way to graph this and the exact Mm -hmm. correct way to describe it. But if you drew two lines, which is how much we know Mm -hmm. and how confident we are about, about it, those two lines peak 
yeah. at about 22. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then they begin and then how much and then how much we know flattens out mm -hmm. and how much we appreciate and understand about it drops. Drops. Exactly. They start <clears throat> separating. And then yeah. when that gap opens up between those two lines and we start to close it again, mm -hmm. that's when we start to grow and mature. Yeah. That that's that's when that's when we start to realize that we need to grow up. Yeah. And I think that part of being in our 20s, and especially for guys like us that were forced into being adults so young, there is this great, there's, 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 there's a cool experience of realizing, like, I don't have to be a 60-year-old person right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, or then I don't have to be 40. Yeah. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm not in a hurry, and I'm not racing towards yeah. that. You know? Yeah. My mm -hmm. 40s have been really good for that. My 40s yeah. have, been, have felt really good of just, like, Oh, I know who I am and I know it's important to me. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, if I had little kids now, I think I would be a really good dad now. Mm -hmm. Um, because like, I just, I feel like I have more patience and a little more grace. And you got all that XP. Then. So much XP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, um, and, and, um, we are, we are extraordinarily close. Good. And um, as, you know, as someone who doesn't have that going in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Yeah. No, it's I'm really sure, awesome. sure it's helped you grow and, and just, yeah. again, just, you know, sometimes, sometimes you have holes and sometimes you, those holes are because you've been shot a bunch of times. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. And, again, and you fill those holes up, you know, yeah. yeah. Regardless of where they came from, you know, yeah. yeah. And now you have beautiful scars, you know, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now they now they're called kids. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, last question: What would uh, River Phoenix thought of Aquaman? Because Aquaman was terrible. It was just, you know, honestly, I think so. I can only base this off of him being like seventeen and me being fifteen. Um. I don't think he would have been into it at all. No, right? I th he struck me as the kind of person who would have read Russian literature. Okay. Yeah. Um, who would have, like I said, he would have had the Philip Seymour Hoffman career. Yeah. He would have made work that was extremely memorable. He would have done things that were challenging. Mm -hmm. I don't see him ever. I don't know. Uh, uh, Aquaman's pretty challenging <clears throat> to yeah, get yeah, through. But for I the swear. wrong reasons. <laughs> I don't think that he ever would have really cared about or participated in things that we view, uh, that we view as like popcorn or diversionary. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, honestly, probably the easiest way to answer this question is he probably wouldn't even have known about it. Uh, yeah. But that said, I am basing that on what I think. Yeah, of course. Fifteen-year-old me would have thought. I, I of think he would. I think him. he would have played Baron Zemo in, in <laughs> Civil War. That's that. That's the career trajectory I, I have for him, uh, Mr. Will Wheaton. Thanks for coming by, dude. This was really fun. It's yeah, nice it's, talking to you. Yeah, nice talking to you too. Yeah, we'll we'll do it again. We'll do it without mics next time. How about okay. that? Yeah, right. yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. sounds good to me. Um, yeah, thanks a bunch. Uh, do you want to plug your stuff? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook as it's Will Wheaton. Mm. My website is willwheaton.net. Um, and uh, sometime in 2020, hopefully, uh, I will have at least one new book coming out. Cool. Uh, hopefully, too. It just depends on what happens with publishing and editors and stuff. Yeah. But uh, I have nearly completed... I completed the first draft of a novel manuscript. It's called All We Ever Wanted Was Everything. Mm -hmm. It's a semi-autobiographical coming-of-age story set in 1983. It sounds like a, like a Modest Mouse album title. <laughs> it's actually a Bauhaus song. Yeah. There it is. Oh, yes, I know that song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other one is called Uncertain Smile, and it's a collection of essays, That speeches. sounds like a porn. <laughs> it's, a, it's a the, the song. Uh, I'm bad at titling things, so I take the titles of songs and use yeah. them to title all of my, my, my books and stories. And that's a collection of shorts, uh, essays, um, speeches, um, and things that I've written about living with depression cool. and anxiety. I mean, cool um, the book part, not the depression part. It's yeah. okay. Uh, like I say to people all the time, I'm sick, I'm not weak. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of my mental illness at all. And I'm actually really proud of the way that I live with it. Oh, that sounds like a, like a, like a Modest Mouse lyric. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not Modest Mouse. <laughs> so thank you, Modest Mouse, for being on the show. <laughs> Stop. 
um, I'm okay. just going to float on out of here. Yeah. Hey, there you, that's, I see what you did there, and I like it. <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, uh, go to uh, this is the Bunny Ears podcast. Uh, let's see. Uh, go visit me on Twitter. I'm at Incredible Kulk. And on the Instagram, I'm at Kulkamania. Um, and also, we do voicemails at the end of the episodes. So, uh, um, uh, so leave us a voicemail because we'll play them sometimes. Uh, the number is 845-393-4629. That's 845-EASY-E-HOAX because we all know <laughs> it was a hoax all along. <laughs> Easy's got the dopest hooks. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks again, dude. It's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's do this again soon. Okay. Peace. We're always getting voicemails. You dial 845 Easy E, your hopes. I said it's 845 Easy E, your hopes. It might sound dumb, but it's not a joke. It's 845 Easy E, your hopes. Motherfucking hoax. That's 845 393 4629. Motherfucking hoax. Voicemails. Hi Max, this is Kelsey. I should totally be preparing for a job interview I have tomorrow, but instead I'm calling you. (laughs) Anyways, I just wanted to let you know that I'm so grateful for the Bunny Ears channel, the podcast is fucking hilarious, and you should totally do live callbacks. And if you do, hopefully I can say that I got the job. (laughs) Um, Hit me up, and yeah, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Take care, Max. Hi Macaulay, it's Allison. Um, I was just calling to say that I really loved the past two episodes. I was super pumped to hear about the defunct one. Hey, Matt. It's Greg again. Hey, uh, I was just, mom called, told me to call you and say, uh, see if you're checking in on those medications. Oh, wait. Oh, shit. I just called the wrong person. This is McCullough Culkin hotline. Oh, I gotta go. I think I just told my grandma to suck some dicks. All right, I'll call you back. You guys have a good day. Later, bro. Macaulay Culkin, I called you like two weeks ago. I should have been prepping for a job interview. Well, I got the fucking job. So everybody who hears this, call Macaulay Culkin instead of prepping for your interview. And it's actually like some weird fucking magic. I got the fucking job. Thank you, Macaulay Culkin. Thank you, Macaulay Culkin. Fuck you. Find me, gag me, take me to the bunny ranch. You are freaking lumberjack! Oh my god. Let's tofu!